Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first of this tutorial series. It's a wonderful opportunity for folks to hear about new areas, new exciting areas, too. And as well as the printed word, all of you will have access to these online. And in addition, uh, later on, we will, to some of these tutorials, be actually adding some audio over voiceovers, too. Uh, it's very good to have this complement both a written chapters as well as presentations that can really provide great insights. And I'm, I'm very happy, I think there's a wonderful talk to start out with about fulfillment optimization. And it's a, an emerging new area, an area where we're trying to uh, combine both the physical stores as well as the online stores and how do we deal with things should be very exciting. And our two present presenters will be sharing the duties here. And I will start by uh, welcoming. Let's welcome Vivek and Jason. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So if it's all right, I'm going to stay down here. It's a little awkward to be up there. Um, so uh, you know, as Doug nicely mentioned, you know, this is a talk about um, what's actually a fair, an evolving area. Right, so uh, the problem's not quite clear yet, or the set of problems clear. Uh, but just at kind of the outset, as Jason and I were thinking about uh, really the, the objective for this tutorial, uh, our objective is much more towards um, sort of giving you a sense of the practical problem, right? Like what, what's, what's actually kind of happening out there, uh, right? And uh, perhaps a sense of uh, where the problem is being taken, right? So, um, you know, we'll, the literature around this area is actually very young, as we were sort of thinking about, you know, really papers that fit closely with this theme, it's probably around 10, right? So it's a, it's a very young, nascent literature, uh, but it's adjacent to fairly established literature, right? So it's adjacent to sort of very established literatures around, uh, let's say, things like, uh, you know, transship, things like that, or, uh, you know, revenue management, right? And, uh, you know, I'm sure in the room, uh, there's expertise uh, in some of those areas. So hopefully this ends up being a little bit of an exposure uh, you know, to, to, to some of that. Um, and so yeah, without, without further ado, you know, let, me, let me actually just get kicked off uh, here, right? So I, I want to sort of start off with kind of the economic motivation for why all this stuff is becoming relevant and important, OK? Uh, so these are Walmart's numbers uh, from you know, leading up to 20, uh, 2018, right? Uh, and you'll notice something pretty interesting over here, right? Uh, which isn't a super surprise, but something to keep in mind. So the first thing I'm going to draw your attention to is sort of the second line, right? Which is sort of total revenue growth, and that's that's reasonably healthy. Okay, so for an established retailer like this, this is actually not not bad. And in fact, uh, Walmart's actually been rewarded by the street uh, for uh, you know for these uh, for these numbers. Uh, but then if you go to sort of the fourth row, okay. And the, uh, you know, so this row over here, and contrast that with the row that's third from uh, you know, the bottom, you'll see that the vast majority of this growth is really coming from uh, you know, growth in sort of the e-commerce channel. Right. And the e-commerce channel, in some sense, right, uh, really captures all transactions that kind of originate on a device. That's how you should sort of think about these, uh, these sort of e-commerce uh, transactions over here. So why is this a problem? Right? So why, why is this an issue? Well, it's an issue for the following reason, right? So if you think about what these people put in the bank, right, it's revenue minus COGS minus cost of fulfillment, OK? So uh, sure, revenue is growing a little bit, right? Uh, COGS, that's not really changing all that much, right? Uh, and if you think about cost of fulfillment, well, that's going through the roof. Why is that? So if you walk into a store and you pick something off a shelf, right, there is a cost fulfillment there, right? Cost of fulfillment is these guys have to maintain a store, there's people walking on the store, there's lights, there's all this stuff. Right? Depending on who you're talking to, right, that cost per unit, per SKU, right, roughly single digit cent. Okay? So it's single digit cents, right? So I go to the store and I pick something off the shelf, right? What is the cost of fulfillment associated with that single digit cents? On the other hand, if you take that same thing, Lowest end, you're paying a couple of bucks, right? Uh, at the higher end of that, you're paying you know double-digit dollars, 
right? So if you kind of think about this, great, revenue is growing a little bit, right? Uh, that's not really changing. And cost of fulfillment, well, that's blown up. So if you start looking at some of this growth, right, this growth is actually good from a top line perspective, but not very good from a gross margin perspective. And in fact, right, uh, gross margin at these companies is hidden in a whole bunch of different ways, but it's suffering as a result. So this is something that's like a driving force where like, if you go into the retail industry today, um, and I'm sure the room has like a few practitioners uh, here as well, right? Uh, this is kind of a driving force in terms of like, hey, you know, what do we, what do, we do to deal with this? Okay, so, so that's kind of the economic thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind, right? Okay, so what is kind of the evolution then as you actually think about you know, how retail has evolved uh, in its connection with uh, sort of the end customer, right? So this is sort of, let's say, a picture circa like late 90s, right? Actually, not even late 90s, sort of take this all the way maybe up to 2005, 2006, okay? Uh, where, uh, as this is a cartoon, but the way you can sort of think about this cartoon is you got sort of, right, this is let's say a retailer that has both a brick and mortar presence and an e-commerce presence. And the way they'd sort of think about their fulfillment network uh, is they've got these sort of individual stores over here, right, each store serving customers that walk into that store. Uh, and then they've got maybe a few, uh, you know, e-commerce distribution centers or fulfillment centers, uh, you know, that serve people sort of online, right? Okay, so that's, that's let's say circa 2005, right? Uh, how's that changed? Okay, so there have been a whole bunch of changes that connect these pools of inventory to customers in a, in a slightly different way, right? So if in addition to dedicated fulfillment, like the early picture, uh, I add, let's say, ship from store. So what is ship from store? Ship from store is uh, you're on your device, you buy something, and that something gets shipped to you, not from a DC, but from a store. Uh, all of a sudden, you start adding these uh, sort of green arcs uh, into the picture, right? Another version of this, uh, which is perhaps you know, really favorable, is something that's called BOPIS, buy online, pick up in store, right? So what is buy online, pick up in store? You're ostensibly part of this pool, right? But I somehow the other kind of get you to walk into, into a store that's near you, go you know, grab the stuff. Right? So essentially I add ship from store and BOPIS and I've built these sorts of arcs over here, right? Um, okay. Then what you can do is you could sort of say, OK, let's add like another sort of way right, of connecting inventory to my customers. Uh, ship to home. What's ship to home? By the way, people have different terms. Ship to home is something where you walk into a store. Uh, right? You walk into a store. You want something. The something's not quite there. right? But then somebody helps you at the store. Says, hey, you know, I'll have this shipped to your home. Uh, and you'll get it there tomorrow or something like that. And what does that do? That sort of says, hey, these people have actually ostensibly walked into the store. And we're going to ship stuff to them from these e-commerce DCs. Well, in doing all of this, right, uh, what have you done? What you've done is you've kind of built out this network connecting pools of inventory to your end customers, right? Um, and as, uh, you know, sort of died in the world inventory ops people, right, what does that mean? What that means is that, like from a strategic perspective, this results in virtual pooling of demand, right? So all we did by drawing all these arcs is we've kind of pooled all of this demand risk together, right? So great, so if I manage to pool all this demand risk, right, uh, you know, why, why is pooling this demand risk good? Pooling the demand risk is good for a whole bunch of different reasons, right? So number one, uh, right, and keep in mind, right, like the, 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 the simple sort of equation we started with, right? So if I pooled all this demand risk, number one, we could sort of hope for lower inventory levels, right, overall across the chain. If I can hope for lower inventory levels, that's hopefully lower COGS. Uh, what else could I do, right? I could say, well, listen, right? Presumably, I think of the trade-off between inventory levels and service levels, right? Uh, when I have this fully connected network, right? Uh, I have a more favorable uh, parade of curves, right? A more favorable trade-off that I can achieve between uh, inventory growth and service levels, levels and service levels. And service levels. So perhaps I can not just improve, uh, you know, inventory levels. I can actually offer better service levels alongside these lower inventory. Why? Because you've kind of interconnected uh, these various pools of inventory with uh, pools of customers. Okay. Uh, and, and yes, if you have better service levels, obviously better revenue, right? What else can you do, right? Uh, you can have faster promise times, right? If I'm shipping from a store, uh, I might actually be able to take advantage of all sorts of sources of transportation liquidity, right? Let's say by partnering with a ship or uh, 
uh, you know, an Uber, whatever it is, right, uh, to get stuff to customers faster. And uh, you know, there's lots of studies, uh, very new studies actually, uh, right, that have shown a massive sort of up, you know, up, up in a massive increase in conversion if you show the customer the ability to get stuff to them faster, right? Um, and then closely related to this, right, uh, proximity to demand uh, is presumably lower fulfillment. So if I actually think about all of these things, right, they all go in the direction of uh, sort of improving this, the, you know, the state of affairs with, request, with respect to this equation over here, right? So why is this not just the end of the story? Right? Because it's, it, it feels like, hey, let's just go do this, right? If we go do this, we're, we're done. So to understand why that's not the case, right, uh, I want to walk you through a couple of simple caricature examples that, weirdly enough, kind of play out, actually, very commonly in practice. OK? So, um, so bear with me, right? And I'm going to walk through like, a couple of these caricature stories. And you'll get a sense of you know, what's the flip side to all of this good stuff over here. OK? So what, what, what's the other? You know, what's the, why is this an actual problem? Right? Um, why, why are we all here? Why does this even merit right? thinking about, uh, about a tutorial? Right? Uh, OK, so ultimately, right, uh, the big challenge to doing this virtual pooling correctly is broadly the problem of optimization under uncertainty. I think that's broadly the crux of the whole thing. Right? Um, and so let's, let's get a sense of how things can go wrong. Right? So let's start with this simple picture over here. Right? Uh, so let's say you're a, a shoe retailer. Right? And this is you know, where all your stores are. And let's say you've actually moved towards actually shipping all of your as it turns out, the shoe retailer I have behind over here is actually doing literally that. Okay. It's a shoe retailer with 1,500-odd stores. And I think, why even have these DCs? Let me actually put all of my inventory into stores. And as of last year, like 95% of their e-commerce gets shipped out of a store. Okay? So what happens at the shoe retailer, right? So let's say they've got these two, store, these two stores over here right, that are carrying this uh, sort of pair of, uh, this, uh, pair of yellow shoes. Okay? And so you've got the, 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 the shoes here in a size 6 and a 6.5. And you've got the shoe over here somewhere in Northern California in a size 6.5. Okay? So uh, let's say a, you know, an order comes in right, in a size 6.5. Uh, what might you do? Well, one reason you might do is you might say, hey, you know, this is sort of the closest store. It's quote unquote zone 1 uh, with respect to the order. Let me go ship this 6.5 out of here. Right? So I go take that 6.5. I ship it out of there. And so now I'm left with a, an inventory position that looks like, hey, I've got a size 6 over here and a size 6.5 over here. OK? So great. Now let's say somebody actually walks into this store. Right? So a, a customer walks into the store to buy a size 6.5. Well, what's going to happen to this customer? Well, if you're lucky, you might be able to convince them that they're gathering in another store and uh, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll be shipped to them outside the store. But there's an increased chance that you're going to lose that sale. Right? So they walked in the store. What they want is not at the store. And so you kind of lost that sale. Uh, of course, if I knew this picture you know, in advance, I'd have shipped the size 6.5 out of there. But I didn't know that in advance. Right? OK, so that's one way this could go wrong. Right? It could go wrong in the sense that um, as you actually run these sort of fulfillment systems, you might actually run them in a way where you're cannibalizing sales in a specific channel. Right? So as I ship stuff out of a store, I'm cannibalizing sales potentially from you know, sales that you could make to customers walking in the store. Right? OK. Um, let's try another one. OK? So let's say the same thing happens, right? A size 6.5 actually shows up over here. Uh, and what you end up doing is the same thing as before. You ship the size 6.5 out of this store. Right? So 6.5 goes out of it. OK, and so we're left with that same state. And now let's say, right, somebody comes in uh, you know, somewhere here, and they order a size 6 and a size 6.5. Very common, by the way, with shoes. Because people don't know their exact size, so they'll order a whole bunch of different sizes. That's why later on, by the way, they'll return one of these, right? So just to add insult to injury. Now, because of what you just did, what's going to happen, right? You're going to have to, you know, send the size six from here and the size six point five out of there, effectively doubling your shipping costs uh, to the customer, right? So the way sort of shipping costs work, and Jason will say more about this later, right? They're very submodular. Right? Uh, you know, the price of sending one pair of shoes versus sending four pairs of shoes is more or less the same. Right? So because I've actually split this up, I'm going to effectively double my shipping costs. Not a great thing. 
OK? Um, OK, so what does this sort of lead to, right? This leads to kind of the flip side of all the good stuff with virtual pooling. The flip side is, uh, this is all the good things. What are the risks, right? The risks are sort of very closely related to what we just showed, right? Uh, there's an active risk of cannibalizing in-store sales. If you cannibalized in-store sales, well, that's actually lower revenue, obviously, right? Another thing you could do is, um, in effectively shipping from the wrong store, the wrong store in hindsight, right? Uh, you could effectively uh, you know, have yourself in a position where overall fulfillment costs go up, right? Because what's happening is downstream from you, right, you end up shipping from suboptimal location. Example this when, uh, uh, when Jason, uh, Jason speaks. The third example, right, like uh, splitting a shipment. Again, right, if, if, I, if I'm doing things and I set myself up into an inventory position that's not ideal with respect to future demand, uh, I might effectively increase my, my fulfillment cost downstream. Okay? So all of this is to say that what we're looking at is kind of a classical problem of optimization under uncertainty. Okay? So why is this a classical uh, problem of optimization under, under uncertainty? Well, because when I actually go sort of pick order, when I actually go receive an order and figure out how to fulfill that order, right? Uh, I'm balancing some measure of immediate reward, right? An immediate reward to lots of different things, right? Not just shipping cost, right? Uh, you know, if you find it advantageous, for instance, to ship quickly to a customer, that might actually feature into what immediate reward actually means. But I, I, what I need to do is balance immediate reward against sort of the opportunity cost of sort of the next state that you're kind of left with, right? So this is a classic problem of optimization under uncertainty, right? Um, and sort of the interesting thing, by the way, right, just to, again, as I said, I want to make this very sort of where things are. Um, if you look at how this problem is actually handled in industry today, right, uh, there are a few exceptions in terms of thinking about the question carefully. But largely, right, uh, what you find people doing is some variant of a myopic uh, strategy, right? Uh, why? There's a whole bunch of reasons why. But the broad reason is that this wasn't ever planned, right? All those arcs that I showed you in the fulfillment network, those sort of got added in time, right? And so the way people think about doing this in practice is some sort of bastardized version of how they were actually doing uh, you know, order management in the good old days of uh, you know, having a dedicated sort of pool. So the way you should sort of think about this is uh, with respect to kind of industry practice, right? 90% of the time, even north of that. I'll switch you out. Oh, okay. You're, cut, you're cut now, so I want to. Uh, that may just be because of my head moving up and down. It might be a short end, so go ahead and. Sorry about that. You're good. Better? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, right, so, so the way you should think about it, predominantly you know, myopic, right? So here's what I want to do with the rest of this talk. All right, so this is, this is sort of the setup, right? And no math, right? You can sort of see very, very simply what, this, what the heart of this problem is all about, OK? So here's what I want to do with the rest of this talk. I want to first off set up a, um, I want to set up a dynamic optimization problem, OK? So think about this dynamic optimization problem as a very bare bones problem, OK? I'm not going to start with all the bells and whistles, right? So we're going to start with a bare bones dynamic optimization problem that hopefully you'll see is, is, is a hard problem. Okay? Now, having set up this hard problem, uh, what I want to do is walk you through how people have dealt with this problem. All right? It turns out, and I'm going to talk about all this before actually getting into the math, it turns out that this problem is very, very, very close cousins to sort of a traditional network revenue management problem. Okay? So and as such, right, what's happened is that one approach to dealing with this is the approach we're all familiar with in network revenue management. And if you're not familiar with that, no problem. We're actually going to walk through all of that, right? So what we'll do is we'll set up the problem, and then we'll walk through how network revenue management might work to actually address this problem. Uh, and we'll talk about some very significant success stories with this network revenue management approach right? that, that Jason and uh, you know, Steve Graves and others uh, right, have, uh, have pioneered at their, uh, at their industrial partner. Right, which is pretty easy to guess. Um, but in any event, right, so very significant successes. From there, 
what I want to then do is talk about, well, OK, great. What's kind of the frontier over here? Right? So does network revenue management, does that approach always work? Turns out right, that this network revenue management approach works if you're dealing with a very high volume, high scale type retail. Okay? On the other hand, if you go to a retailer that's doing, let's say, three or four or five, maybe even $10 billion of business in a year, right, and they're trying to deploy their entire network of stores to become part of this fulfillment network, you run into a significant problem related to forecasting. Okay, so we're trying to solve this dynamic optimization problem, but it's just very hard to look at, you know, build any sort of model of the future, right? Why? Because, you know, hey, they're selling things that sell in very small volumes, or they're selling things that have fashion content, or something of that nature, right? And so as soon as you inject that in, right, as soon as you sort of have, uh, you know, problems with forecasting, you're kind of in like a new territory, right? And so then we'll kind of transition to talking about a slightly distinct approach uh, based on sort of online approximation algorithms, okay, where, where you don't actually need a forecast. And we'll talk about how those work, what, what's known there, uh, practical successes uh, with, with building those sorts of things out, right? And then finally, right, we'll sort of end with kind of talking about like a sense of, you know, what are sort of the open problems, right? And as we go along with all of this, I'll sort of touch on uh, the best I can, right, the various papers that have actually been sort of written in this space. As I said, it's a really kind of burgeoning field. So I think sort of right time, right place to kind of get, uh, you know, to get involved, okay? So with that sort of uh, set up out the way, by the way, maybe I'll pause over here. A a any questions? We've not really talked about any math, and we're going to talk about math now. But before we get into any of the math, questions from the crowd? All good? Feel free to interrupt, right? Like, I mean, there, there's not, I mean, there's, there's, there's a small enough crowd that we can have it pretty online. Okay? All right. Uh, okay, so let's, let's sort of get started over here, right? So here's a pretty simple setup, right? Uh, we're going to think about J supply nodes and I products, right? So, you know, each of those stores or DCs or whatever it is are sort of one of these supply nodes. And these, these nodes are going to be selling a whole bunch of different, are going to be stocked with. Uh, you, know, one, you know, a whole bunch of different products, capital I products, okay? Um, we're going to think about some sort of finite horizon problem. Nothing super special about that, just for concreteness over here, right? Uh, we're going to think about a finite horizon problem. And I'm going to model an order. I'm, I'm going to say very little about modeling an order right now, right? For now, an order is just a random variable, okay? So it's this random variable CT. Right, which can capture all sorts of information about the order. Right? So CT, for instance, could capture the location of the order. CT could capture uh, that order's, the, the customer's preference for speed. Right? Uh, CT could capture things related to uh, you know, how that customer might want to trade off speed with something else. Uh, CT could uh, capture uh, you know, elements of that customer's price sensitivity. A whole bunch of things. Okay? So CT, random variable, tells us our order at time t. Right? And uh, if I think about state, right, uh, my state over here is essentially inventory position, right? So my state is really, uh, you know, how much inventory do I have of each of these products at each of these supply nodes, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's the, uh, that's the S over here, right? Uh, and X is what I'm going to call my decision variable, okay? So X is my fulfillment decision relative to order CT, okay? So CT comes in. I have this vector S of inventory at each of these supply nodes, and then I have a fulfillment decision X, which simply specifies how much of inventory of each type of product I want to take out of each of these nodes. Right? Um, and then we have some feasible set of fulfillment decisions, right? which is a function of my inventory position, ST, and the order coming in, CT. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of denote that set uh, by sort of script X over here. Okay? I'm going to assume the set is not empty, right? That's typically an easy thing to do. Why? Because if you can't fulfill something, what are you going to do? You're going to cancel it, right? And I can model canceling by sort of having some sort of node that has infinite inventory or something of that nature, OK? So I'm going to assume the set is, uh, is not empty. Uh, and then finally, right, uh, associated with every fulfillment decision xt and order ct, I have some reward, right? Uh, this reward can capture a lot of different things. And later on, we'll talk about the various things that practically go into defining what this reward ought to be. Right? But already, you can start thinking about some of these things. Right? Clearly, it should capture how much it costs you. Right? Uh, it should potentially capture you know, how quickly 
you got the stuff, uh, you know, you got the stuff to the customer. It might capture things that are actually related to sort of your internal operations that I'll sort of talk about later. Okay? So that's that's really the problem we want to solve, right? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so it's a good question. So we uh, sort of struggle with what level to kind of keep this at. Uh, fancier versions of this, right? would consider uh, you know, the, an, an, an exogenous process where in addition to taking things out, right, uh, there's some exogenous replenishment process that's bringing things in. Uh, you could consider fancy versions of the problem where you actually control that replenishment process. Right? Um, I'm going to just keep it at this over here, right, where you sort of have fixed, uh, fixed supply. You'll see that really, um, so there's two, two ways of thinking about that. One is it's a heuristic. right? It's a heuristic model for the grander problem. Because frankly, connecting a replenishment system to a fulfillment system, that's a problem for a different day in some sense. The other way you can think about this is in many of these applications, actually, uh, especially if you're in like sort of apparel or shoes or something like that, very often the supply you start with is the supply you actually have. Because I'm selling something, it has like a 12 or 13 week horizon, and it's actually perishable. Okay? So I'm going to keep it at perishable fixed supply. But there's sort of natural extensions you can consider, and Jason has some papers on this. Right, where uh, you can sort of say, oh, there's replenishment happening on the on the assets. Okay. Other other questions. Okay. Good. Okay. So this is a dynamic optimization problem, right? Everybody's familiar with this sort of stuff. Very similar to network revenue management, right? So the first thing you think about when you look at something like this is what's the network revenue management approach to this? Well, the network revenue management approach is really simple. Right? Uh, it's, I'm sure a bunch of you here are actually familiar with it. Right? How does that approach work? That approach says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this sort of differential value function. Right? This is the hard part, right? the differential value function over here. I'm going to look at this differential value function, and I'm going to consider some sort of separable approximation to it. Okay? I'm going to take this differential value function, and I'm going to consider a separable approximation to it. That separable approximation looks like this. Right? And now if you look at the separable approximation, what's it sort of saying, right? The interpretation is, right, I'm consuming, right, xij units of inventory of type i from node j, right? And I need some measure of the opportunity cost of that inventory, right, of type i at node j uh, as of this current point in time, time t. Okay? So very similar to network revenue management. Now, I'm going to sort of make a, a simplification over here, which is a bad simplification, all right? Um, and then later on, I'm going to come back and talk about the simplification and how we actually get along, you know, how, how we get around it, right? But for now, just to keep things simple, right? I would sort of assume that these, this reward is actually separable, okay? That the reward actually takes this form, right? Uh, right? It's some sort of uh, vector r that's a random vector, the function of the, the order that you see, right? Um, you know. Uh, transpose x, which is the, the, the inventory that you're actually consuming. Why is this not a, a, a great approximation, or why is this not a great model? It's not a great model for one of the things I said earlier. right? Remember, shipping costs are actually submodular. Right? And so this doesn't quite capture that submodularity. But nonetheless, right, as it turns out, important problem. And uh, you know, we'll talk about how to deal with that. And actually, it relates to sort of one of the open problems I want to discuss later as well. Okay? So we'll start with this. Okay, we'll say that uh, you know it's this it's this linear function. And now, as soon as I do this, right, uh, I could sort of say, well, again, this is exactly like network revenue management, right? You write down some sort of optimization problem that's equivalent to the optimization problem you'd have if you knew the future, right? So if I knew the future, what would I know? If I knew the future, I'd know these CTs, the orders that were coming in over the future, right? Uh, and I could write down sort of a simple uh, sort of uh, you know, flow problem, right? Or a simple packing problem, right? Where what I'm doing is I'm sort of saying, look, for every order that comes in, I want to figure out the optimal fulfillment decision for that order that maximizes the reward I earn subject to inventory constraints and, of course, subject to making a decision on the order. Make sense? Right? So this is literally what you would actually think of if you were thinking about network revenue management. All right? Okay. So now, because I've written things down like this, by the way, right, I, I don't need to consider i anymore, right? I can actually just separate all this out across different products. I can manage each of the capital I products separately, right? This, this LP just, or IP, however you want to think about it, uh, decom decomposes. So now, 
going ahead, I'm going to get rid of the subscript i over here. I might come back to it later. But for a, a lot of what we're going to talk about next, I'm going to get rid of i. OK, so you're left with something, uh, something like this. OK. So OK, great. But I don't know c, right? I don't know what the orders are. I don't know that future. So now I need to do some sort of modeling. So what I'm going to talk about next is uh, what, to my mind, is kind of the first sort of published approach around this, uh, right? And this is work by uh, you know uh, Jason over here uh, and Steve Graves at MIT uh, that takes a first cut at actually you know going from this high-level network revenue revenue management view of things to something that you can build and implement. Okay? So what's their approach, right? So their approach is the following, right? They say. As I actually think about modeling the CTs, right, I'm going to take a very, very simple view of that of, of the CTs, right. All I'm going to worry about is sort of the location of the CT. Actually, you do something a little fancier. It's actually the location and the mode of transportation. That's that you know the speed that people want. But let's just keep it at, at, at location for this explanation, right. So I'm going to model CT at sort of location, right. And one of the things I'm going to assume is that I'm going to assume that I have access just like network revenue management, right? To sort of the expected value of demand I see at a specific location. OK? So CT is location, and I'm going to assume that I know the expected value of demand at, at any given location, right? That I can, from this period up to time cap t, come up with some estimate of what that demand is actually going to look like. And so having done this, right, you're left with literally a network revenue management problem, right? Which is what? Uh, now, this is just a transformation of the earlier problem, right? Where what we're saying is that, look, uh, I want to sort of maximize the reward I earn uh, across all the different types of orders I have, where on the one hand, I can't consume more inventory than I actually have, right? Uh, and of course, I can't allocate, uh, right? Uh, I have at most d hat k units of type k demand, right? I can't, I can't sell more. Uh, you know, type k orders than I actually have demand for, right? That's the sort of second constraint over here. Um, and we've sort of conveniently dropped the integer sort of constraints because we're thinking this is all high volume, so the in integer constraints don't matter. And again, per revenue management, uh, this tells us that, like, hey, listen, if you look at the dual variables corresponding to this inventory constraint over here, perhaps these dual variables are good dual variables for what I was talking about earlier here, right? So what this says is, Take this optimization problem, solve it, right? Uh, come up with some dual variables over here, right? Uh, and the, the, the way you're going to actually make greedy decisions is simply as follows, right? At any point in time, you're going to maximize immediate reward uh, minus sort of the opportunity cost of fulfilling that reward, where that opportunity cost is computed just from solving this simple linear program. Okay? So this should be pretty familiar, right? And this is kind of literally. Uh, right, the, uh, the, the approach uh, that uh, Jason and Steve took with this sort of partnership with a large, uh, <laughs> what is the term? Large online retailer. Large online retailer, right? With this sort of very mysterious large online retailer, right? Uh, nothing but network revenue management, right? And so what, what I want to do is, right, talk now about, let's say you start here. Right? Let's just, this is the, the most basic thing we could kind of think about, right? Let's say we start here. How good is this? How, how well does this work? Okay? So Jason's going to take over and say a little bit about that in a second. I did want to sort of just very quickly say you can obviously show to those interested in theorems, right? And there's a theorem like this, I think, in Jason's thesis, where, I mean, you know, of course, in sort of the fluid regime, something like this is basically optimal. Right? It's the right thing to do in the fluid regime. Uh, it's also worth pausing on this over here. The other reason I wanted to kind of put this in, although the result is sort of obvious, right? The, the, the reason I wanted to put this in is if there were an example of a domain where this result, this assumption is actually not true, it is actually sort of when you actually look at broader retail. Okay, so when you go out of these sort of large, uh, very large retailers that actually truly have high volume, you very, very quickly get to folks where we're talking about numbers in the single digits. And so it's not clear whether you know, something like this is tenable anymore. But nonetheless, right? let's start with asking, OK, we start with this simple network revenue management approach. How well would something like this work at sort of a large, uh, you know, at a large retailer? So we're going to take a little digression and talk about 
implementing this at a large retailer, how well it actually worked, and then we'll come back to the track that, that, we're, that we're sort of talking about over here. Right, so Jason, you want to do that? All right, great, thanks. Uh, my name is Jason Achimovic. So uh, as Vivek uh, alluded to, I'm gonna talk about the sort of use case, uh, the simpler version uh, where we worked with an industrial partner to implement the heuristic Vivek outlined. Uh, and just to give you some context, uh, it's a nice case to start with because uh, there does lack some of the complexity of the other one where in the sense that it's a pure online retailer. Right, so the first point up there, we don't have uh, in-store cannibalization we have to worry about. Uh, and there's also, at the time we were doing this a couple years ago, there was this, no same day, essentially. And what the implication of uh, no same day is that any warehouse can ship to any customer, because the fastest uh, we were thinking about was overnight. And so you can ship from, you know, we're in Seattle now, you can ship from Florida to Seattle overnight. And so there's not really, uh, anybody who wants something could be shipped. Um, this retailer, so we're, in terms of no same day, we're thinking about these four customer speed options. That's different from ship mode. This is something that the customer selects. The customer could select same day, two day, four day, eight day. Uh, and so as Vivek alluded to earlier, your demand nodes, if we think about there being about a thousand zip three, zip three is the first three digits of a US zip code. So there's about a thousand zip three regions in the US. There's actually about 4,000 nodes that we're thinking about, the four customer speeds that they can choose multiplied by the 1,000 zip, uh, the zip three geographical regions. Now, the reason I mentioned the customer ship option is different than the actual, I mean, the customer ship speed is different than the ship option. The customer can choose today, but the online retailer can get it there by a truck or by an airplane. So that's not necessarily perfectly uh, doesn't map exactly to the actual shipping mode. And because customers, when they choose one of these four ship speeds, they are paying by the speed, they're not paying by the actual ship mode, and they're not paying by the actual shipping costs. So for instance, there might be a $3 charge for four day, or a eight day is free. And so if you can get that four day cheaper, every ship savings goes to the bottom line. And we think about why that's important, these ship savings go to the bottom line, is for, if you look at some big online retailers, 12% of revenues are going to outbound shipping costs. That's not necessarily the fulfillment costs or things like that, that's shipping costs. So that's their, either their FedEx, UPS bill, or their internal, that's the, it takes to get the loading dock to the customer's doorstep. So 12% of revenues are going to ship costs. So even like small improvements, 1%, 2%, is tens and tens of millions of dollars in savings. And uh, as was alluded to earlier, so the customer chooses the speed, the retailer has to get it there by a certain mode, and these shipping costs are not necessarily linear. So this is just, I just got this off the UPS website. Here we are in Seattle, that's the upper left-hand corner uh, in the yellow, and these are UPS, just go to ups.com. These are the ground transit times from every location in the continental United States to, well actually even the non-continental, uh, to Seattle. So, if, it, if I ordered something right now today, and if it was in any of that yellow area, UPS would deliver it by ground, overnight, which is pretty cheap. Uh, if it's in that brown area, where you see like Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Utah, it can still both go by ground in two days. But if the only place that exists is sort of on the east coast in that orange, it's gotta go by airplane. So for instance, if I'm here in Seattle, and let's say, I want to exercise a little bit. I order a 60 pound exercise bike and I want it overnight because I want it really fast. And let's say, uh, at least at the time, this online retailer charged a specific fee for overnight. Well, if, if it was in, let's say, Oregon, then 
if I wanted it overnight, the retailer would pay $35 to ship this 60 pound exercise bike to me. Uh, if it was in New York, it would cost $467 for them to ship it overnight to me, the 60 pound bike. So you think about this is where some of the, these are some of the cost savings that we're trying to save, especially when we start to think about uh, next day, two day, where the airplane costs uh, can really drive some of these shipping costs up. So anytime we can save an airplane, anytime we can um, deliver this immediate stuff by ground as opposed to more expensive means is the kinds of costs that we're attempting to save with this work. All right, so the heuristic that Vivek mentioned, uh, so basically when we started working with this online retailer, they're using uh, myopic policy essentially. An order would come in, they would check the different, um, so I might use the term FC, fulfillment center. Uh, you can think about it like a distribution center or a warehouse, but for direct to customer for online. They would check which FC was cheapest to the customer and just choose ship from that FC. Uh, the heuristic that we developed with them was to say, okay, and, and Vivek just mentioned, I'm just repeating this, is basically the, the immediate reward, the immediate reward is negative the cost. So whatever the cheapest, F, that cheapest cost was, plus we uh, solve that uh, linear program, we get the dual variable off the supply node, so plus the opportunity cost of depleting a unit of inventory from that warehouse. So that's the one I say we apply the heuristic to real data. The heuristic is the immediate cost plus the absolute value of the dual variable. And the dual variable representing an estimate of the opportunity cost saying, hey, I had 10 units in this warehouse, that's pretty good. Now I have nine units, that's worse. How much worse? Well, I can put a dollar figure to that from the linear program and that's the opportunity cost that we were working with. So we developed this heuristic uh, and we applied it to some data from our industrial partner. And just to give you a sense is we took a stratified sample of 2,600 SKUs. Uh, there were about a dozen FCs that held these SKUs at the time. Uh, we looked about over the course of one month or really four weeks. And so there are one and a half million orders for these 2,600 SKUs um, that ranged anywhere uh, that on average was 144 SKUs per week. But the per week sales of the slowest SKU is about one. The per week sales of the fastest SKU is about 1250. And so we had a wide range in there of slow moving SKUs as well as fast moving SKUs as well. Now, um, the question about like multi item orders came up a little bit. And so just to give you a sense, uh, I'm not gonna talk about it today. We can talk offline. We did sort of do a hack to account for multi item orders and sort of value more highly SKUs that were in FCs that had a lot of other items, because it's better if you have, hey, a lot of other items that it could possibly ship with. Uh, and when we did, you, uh, we talk offline about that, or in the paper, there's 300,000 SKUs that were ordered along with these 2,600 SKUs that we were focusing on for this simulation analysis. All right, so this heuristic, so that's, that's what, we applied this heuristic to this real data, and what we find is basically the perfect hindsight uh, there's about 3% opportunity on the table. So if you had a crystal ball and you perfectly matched every order uh, to every unit of supply in each of the FCs, you could reduce your shipping costs by 3% and the heuristic saved 1%. So capturing about a third of the opportunity that was on the table. Uh, and now in terms of the details, some more details around that is we did have a forecast. Uh, we had a forecast of what demand was going to be, uh, and that's what you, so here's the LP up there, and that little D hat K, well what is that? That's our forecast of what demand is gonna be. Now we did, uh, we did do this uh, for these simulation results uh, out of sample, in the sense that when we, were, when we simulated the heuristic on the industrial retailer's data, we used our own simple exponential smoothing model just to come up with this D hat K. So basically looking at some past data, simple exponential smoothing uh, to come up with a forecast uh, for that D hat K. And there wasn't a lot of extra opportunity on the table. So that bottom point, you know, if we assumed we knew exactly the daily forecast, uh, or the, if we knew the exact daily rate of demand, we could go from 1.07% to 1.11%. So this simple forecasting worked pretty well. 
And you know, as Vivek mentioned, you can do some more complex stuff. So we could have done like a time expanded uh, model, especially where we might, we did think about, uh, to the question that came up before also, we did think about supply as an exogenous uh, process. So think about orders that were already placed, replenished from orders, and they were just coming in at these different times. We could have time expanded it, but for computational reasons, we just compressed it all into this, uh, into this uh, D here. And basically, we had to choose our future horizon, and basically, we, we looked ahead. You know, how far ahead do you look? Well, especially with this exogenous supply, we looked ahead until the lowest expected on-hand inventory level, and that was the horizon we, we did for, for choosing uh, over how many days should we aggregate this D hat K. All right, some other details. Um, these are just some things that we found when we were working with this data. You know, as I mentioned in the bottom right, there's about 1,000 zip threes. Uh, you multiply that by four, because those customers can choose one of four options. So you could write the LP where you've got 4,000 demand nodes, um, or you could cluster it pretty coarsely up in the upper left where you, know, you only have about two dozen geographical regions. And it turns out there's not much value to really finely modeling all the ZIP3 geographic areas. Uh, and so here I just have a plot here in terms of number of clusters. So this is basically number of uh, clustered ZIP3 regions. We test that all the way down to 10, all the way up to uh, 1,000. Um, and here the blue line is on the right-hand axis, so this is the runtime. Normalize that does start at zero, so basically, not surprisingly, the more fine your geographic regions are, the longer it's going to take. Uh, but it barely buys you anything in terms of improvement. So again, this orange line, look what this y-axis, uh, you know, I did not start it at zero, and I'm, I'm pointing that, I just started at just 1%. So basically, this is barely any improvement of the heuristic over the myopic. It's still in that you know, 1.06, 1.07% range. And you can save a lot of runtime by pretty coarsely aggregating your zip threes, which maybe in hindsight um, is reasonable in the sense that we only have about a dozen FCs. So is, you know, is there really that much value to, to doing that more finely? You know, we also had a choice to make in terms of how frequently do we update these dual variables. So we have some way. Uh, if you read the paper where we um, basically the lower the inventory level gets, the more frequently we would update that SKU, uh, the dual variable for that SKU. So here I just have it, um, you know, pretty vague, very frequent updates, very seldom updates, and the runtime. So the runtime run time is, um, it's a log scale, so maybe a factor of, uh, 1 to 16, and again, you know, you do gain, you know, a lot more value than you saw on the other plot, but still, once you, you know, are sort of in this regime here, there's not that much value to really updating your dual variables uh, super often. So we get a lot of the value with a fraction of the runtime. Now, if we look at which SKUs improved, the minority of SKUs actually improved. So when I, we look at the simulation uh, results, where we simulated, again, we're simulating the heuristic versus a myopic policy on the data of our industrial partner, and the data is 1.5 million customer orders. So for 83% of those 1.5 million orders, the myopic policy and the heuristic had the exact same decision. So only about 17, so all that improvement in this case came from only about 17% of the customer orders. If we looked a little, oh, well, this is, uh, okay, so this is not too visible uh, here. So what do we see here? Which SKUs improved? Um, ones that were scarce, meaning that there was not a lot of inventory in the system. So I know, <laughs> I've, I've looked at this plot enough times to know exactly where um, the other dots are. So what do we have here? Along the x-axis, inventory to sales ratio. So when this is about one, it means you ran out of the item. Uh, when this is about five, it means that you had five times as much inventory as there were sales. So you have a lot of inventory relative to the sales. Along the y-axis here, it's the percent improvement of the heuristic over the myopic. Now the black dots here are the per is the perfect hindsight. That's if you had a crystal ball. And 
I'm going to draw this with a red line. This red line is the heuristic. You can, you can kind of see it. So that's, so basically, with the point being that both for the perfect hindsight and for the heuristic, a lot of that you know, is about 1%. Um, the heuristic did 1% improvement overall, but it did about 3% three, uh, 3 improvement on SKUs that there weren't a lot of inventory for. Fast movers also improved uh, better in this, I mean, in the sense that, hey, that makes sense. We're using a pretty straightforward linear program. The demand, we're just taking the expected value of demand, pretty straightforward forecast. And so that's going to work a lot better on your fast movers than your slow movers. So again, the black dots is the perfect hindsight heuristic. And along the x-axis, we have the sales volume over four weeks. Um, and along the y-axis is the same as the percent improvement that the heuristic did over the myopic. So on slow movers, there's not a lot of opportunity. So again, the black dots is the crystal ball version. There's not a lot of opportunity on the slow movers, and there's more opportunity percent-wise on the fast movers. And if I were to, I'm going to draw the, uh, the sort of line of the heuristic, is the, the heuristic does not, here's where it doesn't go. It doesn't go like this. It goes kind of flat and then comes up more. And the point being that the heuristic gains a larger fraction of the crystal ball version on the fast movers. And this, these two plots I just showed are um, in our original paper, and I'm happy to talk about them offline. I know they're not showing up well. But again, the point being here that it's not like 50%, it's not 30% all the way across. It's, I'm just going to make up some numbers like 10 to 20% here and 40 to 50% out here. Uh, and so this, uh, we worked with an industrial partner. It was implemented in 2012 and used to make their fulfillment decisions in North America. And when they did their analysis, they found that the improvement, the sh reduction in shipping costs that they observed were analogous to the results we had in the paper, which was on the order of about 1%. So that's, that's the implementation of this simpler version where we're just pure play online of this LP when you have good forecasts or when you have forecasts at all. And I'll turn it over back to Vivek now. Yeah, yeah, that's coming up. So think of these as supply nodes. So in the simplest version of the problem, they're all warehouses. We're next going to actually move into talking about things where it's a mix of warehouses, stores, transshipment centers, so forth. OK? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think like if you look at this from a network revenue management perspective, I think the big sort of point over there in the network revenue management literature is actually that in sufficiently high volume, you're not actually giving up anything, right? Uh, and you sort of see that play out over here, right? When you solve these clairvoyant linear programs that can look at the future, right? That's the most you could possibly get. So he was able to recapture a lot of that value when the volume was sufficiently high. So uh, from the network RM world, we know that if the volume's sufficiently high, you're not really giving up very much. Okay. All right, so that's kind of like the vanilla thing, right? Where can you take this vanilla approach? So the first thing you can do um, is you can sort of start thinking about, OK, what are you know, fancier problems to solve, right? So the first thing uh, that I want to point out is sort of dealing with multi-item orders. Now, one thing you could do with sort of dealing with multi-item orders is you could say, run Jason's approach, run these separately across products, right? Uh, when an order comes in, you come up with a fulfillment decision across the component order lines within that order, and then you come up with a decision for the whole thing by just sort of consolidating kind of the best options, right? Just consolidate all of these in some way. Uh, can you do better than that? So it turns out that you can, and then this sort of nice paper uh, uh, by Jacine and, uh, and Sina from uh, 2014, uh, what these folks do, same flavor, right? 
they solve uh, you know, one of these sort of deterministic linear programs. These determin the deterministic linear program still sort of gives you a marginal answer. Right? It gives you a fulfillment decision per component product within the order. But then when they convert that to, uh, when they convert that to a decision for the entire order, they use a clever correlated rounding scheme right? that sort of says, hey, listen, I'm, I can interpret these fractional solutions as randomization. Right? Now let me find a joint distribution across these right? uh, that stays correct to the marginals, but it's the most favorable joint distribution uh, with respect to uh, you know, fulfillment cost. Right? And they execute this, uh, this idea pretty nicely. There's a very nice kind of interpretation to it. And what's nice about it is it sort of builds on the same uh, you know, deterministic linear programming framework. OK, what's more? What, what more can you do? Right? Um, so Pavitra here has a bunch of uh, you know, papers on this topic where so you can start thinking about, hey, listen, uh, there are other levers we can start thinking about. In addition to the fulfillment decision, I can actually think you know, about fulfillment decisions jointly with sort of pricing decisions. Right? And all this falls into kind of a sort of a broader you know, framework of connecting sort of the connection with the customer, right? The price the customer sees, the options the customer sees, the search ordering that the customer sees on the website with kind of what's going on sort of uh, you know, on the back end, right? In terms of uh, you know, fulfilling. So there's a couple of these examples, as I mentioned, there's a sort of nice paper by Pavitra, uh, right? There's a couple other uh, you know, uh, papers. Uh, by some folks, uh, you know, at Michigan. That's the lay, uh, you know, at all papers. There's two of them actually, uh, right? Where again, they're sort of thinking about, uh, you know, whereas Pavitra's paper is perhaps about moving demand across channels. Uh, you know, here it's sort of more generally about shaping that demand, so it's sort of cheaper to fulfill. Uh, what's the game? The game is sort of the same game, right? Uh, you have a deterministic program, but with some of these problems, unfortunately, that deterministic program is no longer an easy deterministic program. It's a much harder one. Right, so uh, you know you're left with something nonlinear, often non-convex, and as such, uh, right, you need a whole bunch of different tricks to actually solve them. So, for instance, in this 2019 paper, uh, right, the general sort of approach is sort of a Shirley Adams type, uh, you know, uh, uh, sequence of relaxations. Uh, you know, one of the lay papers has discretized price factors, all sorts of tricks, effectively, to solve what's effectively a harder deterministic linear program. Okay. Um, so where are we? Okay. So we start out with this fulfillment problem. And we said it's a hard dynamic optimization problem. And we said, well, if I go to the world of network revenue management, I have a simple recipe for these problems. Right? What's my simple recipe? Is I imagine that the future is evident to me. I write down a deterministic optimization problem. I solve that deterministic optimization problem. And the dual variables of that problem give me a sense of uh, you know, opportunity cost. Now. If you, if you think back to, uh, to Jason's Prezo, right? Jason was sort of saying, hey, look, you've got these 1,000 zip threes, right? At uh, sort of industrial partner scale, apologies, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> your fault for not catching this. Uh, at industrial partner scale, right? In actually his set, right? That's about 0.14 units of demand per week per zip three, okay? So you're gonna sell a tenth of a product in a week at any given zip three. Now, if you think about coming down a notch right from this industrial partner, which owns 50% of the e-commerce market, right, uh, to let's say general retailers, you're looking at scales that are frequently 100x smaller. Right? So now if we're looking at this super sparse scale, the question becomes, OK, the basic premise of actually solving this deterministic uh, sort of uh, program actually breaks. And so how do we deal with that, right? So here what I want to do is present, come back to that sort of optimization problem that we set up and talk about a slightly different approach. OK, an approach that we could try out when forecasts are perhaps not so easy to come by, right? So now what I want to tra transition to is, right, we have these orders, CT. Earlier we said uh, we can actually model out these orders in that we can actually come up with forecasts of these orders in a reasonable way. Now what I want to ask is, what if that's basically just impossible? Right? What if it's really, really hard to actually come up with these forecasts? Right? Um, and by the way, this is a very reasonable thing. Okay? Uh, if you actually get into a regime where these forecasts, forecasts are hard, and you build a system that's actually doing this, right, uh, you may actually find the system doing something nonsensical. Uh, and then the folks that actually run this will start looking at this nonsensical stuff 
and say, wait a second, this is broken. It doesn't work. Right? And uh, as we were trying to build out this uh, solution, that was a real experience. Right? So we said, well, hey, listen, forecasting is actually hard. Right? So what can we do if forecasting is actually hard? So what I want to talk about is a simple approach. It's slightly more complicated than the deterministic linear program, right? Uh, but not too much more complicated uh, that we can say some nice things about and that in addition works very well in practice, okay? In this sort of, uh, in this sort of area where forecasting is actually hard, okay? So what am I going to do? I'm actually going to say that, hey, if I come back to this optimization problem over here, right, the uncertainty in this problem what these rewards, right? These RCTs that come from the orders that I'm actually going to get. So as opposed to trying to build a forecast for these RCTs, I'm just going to say uh, right, that these RCTs are effectively adversarial. Now, in describing the nature in which they are adversarial, uh, bear with me for a second as I describe this adversarial model. Okay? So one thing to say right off the bat, right? if these RCTs were fully adversarial, it's pretty easy to show that you can't actually do very much with this problem. You're sort of screwed. Okay, there's no, there's no uh, algorithm that you can construct, and this is provable, I'll show you in a second, right? Uh, where you can hope to get any meaningful sort of answer. Okay? That's to be expected, right? An adversary can do anything. I mean, hey. So let's like, come up with really what a reasonable adversary might be. Okay? So here's how I'm going to actually think about the adversary, right? So first off, you know, as opposed to keep you know, tracking along the CT everywhere, Right? I'm going to remove the CT, and I'm just going to call it RTJ. And the way to think about that is, this is the reward that you get from fulfilling the order that arrived at time t out of node j. Okay? Remember, we're still thinking about like a single product at a time. Right? So reward that you get from fulfilling order t out of node j. Right? And earlier we were saying we needed sort of a forecast for this. Now I'm saying no forecast. That's actually hard for me to do. So how do I actually express this? I'm going to write this as ZTJ times r bar tj. Okay, why am I writing it like that? I'm writing it like that because I'm going to make different assumptions on ztj and r bar tj. Okay? So what is ztj? Right? ztj is something that's either 0 or 1. I'm going to allow that to be entirely adversarial. Okay? So what does ztj effectively capture? Right? ztj, by allowing this to be adversarial, effectively encodes Right? Uh, really sort of the eligibility for, of an order. So for instance, ZTJ lets me encode an entirely adversarial in-store arrival process. Right? So imagine you had an in-store in uh, order right, at time t. Well, that in-store order can only be fulfilled out of the store where that order actually arrived. Right? Somebody walked into the store, I can only fulfill them from the store. So, that ZT, so ZT for that store would be 1, for that supply node would be 1, and it would be 0 pretty much everywhere else. So I'm going to allow this ZTJ process right, to be completely adversarial. Right? The R bar, right, I'm going to have to parameterize. And you'll see, you'll see why in a second. The R bar, right, what I'm going to say is, I have sort of an upper bound on the range that R bar can take. Okay? So if I look at the, you know, the, largest, the ratio of the largest value of R bar to the lar smallest value of R bar, I'm going to encode that by some, some parameter kappa. Okay? So first off, right, what can we, in this model, can we actually hope to do something? Right? What can we hope to do in a model like this? And one thing I'll, I'll say right off the bat, by the way, right, uh, is this is sort of a, a form of an online matching problem. It's closely related to a problem that's called the AdWords problem. Okay? Uh, the AdWords problem is a problem that caricatures how Google might actually do uh, ad matching. Right? Another domain where building a forecast that's meaningful at any sort of fine granularity is very hard to do. Okay? Uh, so in the AdWords problem, really you can sort of think about that problem as just having the ZTJ. No R bar. Okay, the, the R bar in that problem, for the R bar in that problem, kappa is effectively one. Okay? Over here, kappa is not one. Right? Uh, and so in that sense, it's a generalization of that problem. So what can we say? Okay, so first off, what can one hope to do in this model? Right? So here's what one can hope to do. Okay? So one can show that no online algorithm, right, randomized or otherwise, can achieve a competitive ratio better than 1 over 1 plus log kappa. Right? Kappa being that sort of thing that parameterizes how, how hard this, this problem actually is. Right? Um, 
I'm not going to talk about how one proves this. It's sort of like a Yao's min-max principle uh, sort of idea, right? So what is competitive ratio, though, right? So competitive ratio is, right, like Jason was showing earlier. Jason was showing this picture of what did you get if you got to see the future? And the thing he was tracing out with his pointer, what would you get if you kind of ran you know, sort of his online algorithm? The competitive ratio is the ratio of those two, right? And what this is saying is that in the model that I just set up, irrespective of the algorithm you come up with, you can't beat 1 over 1 plus log kappa. Okay? So in particular, if you can get to 1 over 1 plus log kappa, you're optimal in this model. All right? And as I mentioned, right, for the, uh, for the adverse problem, kappa is 1. Right? So this, this theorem doesn't really, really tell you a whole bunch in that model. Um, and then like, more practically, right? There is some question with like, how do you actually go about modeling rewards? I'll say a little bit about that in a bit. Uh, but typically, you should sort of think about kappa as being sort of two okay, in practice. Think about kappa as being roughly that number. All right? All right, so this is what you can do. right? It doesn't say anything of what you can actually achieve. So let's actually come up with an algorithm. And here's sort of the nice thing. Okay? So the algorithm I'm going to talk about over here is very similar to Jason's algorithm, right? to what Jason talked about or to the algorithms that come out of these deterministic linear programs. Right? I'm maximizing immediate reward minus opportunity cost. Right? Except that, whereas earlier, this, this opportunity cost came out of solving some linear program. Right? Earlier, the opportunity cost came out of solving a linear program where uh, that linear program crucially took as input some sort of forecast. Right? Over here, I'm not going to do that. Right? Instead, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say, that I'm going to start the lambda somehow. Okay? Start the lambda at 1, right? wherever you want to start it. Right? Uh, and then over time, I'm going to slowly update lambda. Okay? So every time I make, an, I, make an order, you know, I make a decision, I'm going to actually update lambda. So let me actually walk you through this update, because it's a really intuitive update. Right? What is this update actually saying? Broadly speaking, this update is saying, that, so, so just some notation, right? So at time t, let's say that I decided to fulfill order t out of node j star t. Okay? So let me say that again. Order t comes in, and I fulfill order t out of node j star t. Okay? I will then update my estimate of the opportunity cost at node j star t. I'll leave the opportunity cost in other places unchanged. Right? So how will I update that opportunity cost? I'm going to update it in a very intuitive way. Okay? It's a weighted average of what the opportunity cost was before you made that allocation. right? And essentially, the bank per buck, right? the reward you got, essentially, per unit inventory consumed from the allocation decision that you actually made. Right? So if you think about it, this is your new estimate of the, of the opportunity cost. This is your old estimate. And we're taking a weighted average between this old estimate and over here, right, the ratio of the reward that you just earned divided by essentially the inventory that was there to offer you that reward. Okay, so it's reward normalized by inventory at that node. Does it make sense? Right? So if you sort of think about what a dual variable is doing, a dual variable is telling us, right, what's the sort of value on the margin to an additional unit of inventory, right? In a sense, that's what this is doing. It's saying, hey, I had x units of inventory left. I just got this much value out of it. Here's my estimate of, that, uh, you know, of, of, of what that was. So it's r divided by s. And I'm just going to average that. Okay? We can go deeper into this, but let's just leave it at this level. Right? What can you say about this? Right? So I've deliberately put in alpha 1, alpha 2, and beta, because later on, I'm going to talk about how one tunes this in practice. But from a theoretical perspective, you can actually already say nice things about this. Right? So from a theoretical perspective, there are settings of alpha, of the alphas, and of the beta that give you the following result. Okay? And, and don't worry about the math on the slide. Right? I just want to say this. There are settings of alpha and beta such that the resulting algorithm okay, achieves a competitive ratio that looks like 1 over 1 plus log kappa. Okay? So that is to say. Right? And by the way, right, I can, I, the reason I've set this particular set of parameters over here is when you pick kappa equals 1, right, this reduces to uh, e minus 1 
uh, this reduces to e minus 1 uh, over e, which is exactly what you would actually expect for the AdWords, AdWords problem. You can do another sort of scaling where you get 1 over 1 plus log kappa, and this is just 1. Putting that aside, all this is saying is that from uh, an online algorithm design perspective, this algorithm that I just talked about is actually optimal. You can't hope to do any better. Okay? So that's an optimal algorithm, right? Now the question is, how well does this actually work in practice? Right? So let's talk about how an algorithm like this might actually work in practice. Okay? Um, I was actually going to go through a proof of something, but I think we'll skip that. Let's see how we do it. Yeah, let's skip this proof. I, I wanted to, by the way, there's a lot of open problems related to online algorithm design. And that's why I wanted to kind of walk through sort of the proof of this. It's actually remarkably simple, right? It's like a half page proof. Um, but, but, but some of the open problems I'm going to talk about later relate to sort of what are interesting online algorithms to actually build over here that are actually practically relevant. People actually care about them. Okay? So let me actually skip the proof, right? Um, and get straight to, to real stuff, right? Building this stuff. Okay. So now I'm actually going to talk about an implementation. This was actually the second implementation of this, uh, the algorithm I showed you. The algorithm I showed you was implemented at a, a slew of details, right? And uh, this, 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 uh, this, this is sort of one of the first few, OK? Uh, and I can actually name the retailer. Uh, this is uh, Urban Outfitters, OK? So Urban Outfitters uh, is sort of a, an apparel retailer, a fashion apparel retailer. And they have three brands, Urban Outfitters, uh, Free People, and Anthropology. Right? They sell sort of high fashion stuff. Okay? The stuff is in the stores. It's in the stores for sort of 13 weeks, uh, and then it's out the stores. Right? Um, these are sort of disguised sort of numbers uh, that come from free people, okay? which is kind of the retailer with the highest fashion content. Right? So you can imagine highest fashion content equals hardest to predict. Right? Um, so just in terms of sort of dimensioning, right? sort of 129 odd styles. Uh, right, about 100,000 odd units of demand. The average number of orders per style is 913. The average weekly in-store orders per style is sort of 0.4, right? Um, and so if you break this down, by the way, to a skew level, that number is tinier because you're going to actually break that down by all its sizes, right? So it's, it's a really, really small number, right? And the number of fulfillment nodes in this network, and this I'm putting in deliberately, right, actually is larger than the number of fulfillment nodes in the sort of massive industrial partner that, uh, that uh, Jason talked about. Why? Because all the stores are fulfillment nodes. right? So in this sort of setting, it's routine to get to problems where you're dealing with thousands of fulfillment nodes. Okay? So what actually happens over here? Now, there's a couple of different things to actually measure. right? And um, you can ignore this sort of throughput slide, uh, this throughput sort of number uh, for now. right? Let's just focus on these two. So I'm measuring two things. I'm measuring lost sales, okay, and the total sort of shipping cost incurred. Now remember, right, that what we said is we're actually dealing in a world of rewards, right? So I have to actually pick some sort of combination of, well, the lost sales part of it, and the uh, you know and the uh, 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 total shipping part of it, right? Uh, where I actually act uh, and I frame that as a reward, and I act to actually optimize that reward. Now, under the, the, the combination that we actually, now you can clearly pick a combination where sort of a clairvoyant algorithm would do better than us on both. For the particular combination that we picked, right, it turns out that we actually do pretty well. That is to say, when we actually look at sort of the clairvoyant optimal algorithm, and this is sort of the, the perfect hindsight algorithm, right, that takes lost sales, which in a myopic, the baseline is basically myopic, it was what, what was in place, right? Under the myopic sort of setup, you'd have about 12,400 units of lost sales. Okay? Uh, that, under this sort of clairvoyant optimal, comes down to 7,800 units right, of lost sales. Uh, and if you actually think about, there's a typo over here, if you think about this primal dual algorithm I talked about, it kind of captures most of the gap between the clairvoyant optimal and uh, you know, the lost sales you would get if you could see the future. And actually, if you looked at total shipping cost incurred, it's actually lower. And why is it lower? It's lower because of this sort of weighting, right? So just under this particular weighting that combines these two objectives, right, there's nothing stopping us from being better on one of those dimensions. You can clearly pick a combination where you know, the primal dual does worse than both of these, right? 
uh, but then this number would actually be smaller. Okay, that's how you should think about this. So, um, okay, so what are we seeing over here, right? What we're seeing over here is, despite a forecast, that's the key message, right? There's no forecast here, right? Zero forecast. Despite a forecast, we can get really, really close to essentially what a clairvoyant algorithm would have done, right? In a domain where forecasting is actually really, really difficult, right? The other thing is that this is really lightweight. Oops, where did that go? Oh gosh, I shouldn't have gone back this far. Uh, this, this is sort of a really, really lightweight thing to actually run, right? And that's going to be relevant in a second, all right? OK, so uh, let's get closer to real world, right? So in the real world, as people actually think about these rewards, right, there's a whole question around how these rewards should even be formulated, right? Uh, so what are things that people actually care about? Okay, people care about a whole bunch of things. Let's start with the simple ones. Right? People obviously care about shipping costs. People care about split shipments in addition to their impact on shipping costs. So split shipments impact shipping costs, but they have other issues associated with them as well. So when you pay you know, $500 to buy like six things, right, you don't want this necessarily coming to you in six different packages. You'd really like it to come to you in sort of one, in one shop. There's actually value associated with that. So in addition to kind of the shipping cost thing, you really want to reduce split shipments. Onesies. You remember how I talked about the person that actually buys the size 6 and 6.5 and returns the 6.5 because it didn't fit her? Well, the way she typically will do this is she'll take that 6.5, go to the store closest to her, right, and leave it at that store, right? And that might not have been part of the assortment in that store. In fact, what very often happens is the store will take that, put it in a box, and maybe a week later or two weeks later ship it back to a DC. So that, that unit of inventory is actually missing in action for a while. A much better thing is, hey, put it on sale. Right? Why even ship it back? Just ship it. It's already in the store. Ship it out of there. Onesies are basically products that are in the store that shouldn't be part of the store's assortment. And you, know, you name it, right? pick a brick and mortar retailer. This is a major problem for them. Okay? You want to get this out of the store. Right? Uh, weeks of supply. Right? What do I mean by this? So I was talking about lost sales. Right? I'm never really going to convince you of lost sales, what lost sales were, because hey, they're lost sales. Right, you don't actually see them. So you need a leading metric for lost sales. Right? I, need, I need some kind of leading indicator to show that you're not cannibalizing sales. What's a good leading indicator? One leading indicator is the following. Right? If you actually fulfill out of stores that have low weeks of supply, right, that should be a bad thing. Right? If you have low weeks of supply relative to in-store demand, that should be a bad thing. Right? Conversely, if you ship from stores that have high weeks of supply relative to demand, that's a good thing, right? And so what you would want to do is send these orders to stores that have high weeks of supply. So you might care about all four of these things, right? Uh, and sort of in typical implementations where we sort of run the algorithm I described across a whole slew of retailers in sort of all, all over the place, right? Uh, fashion apparel, shoes, uh, you know, general merchandise type retailers. All over the place, right? What do we actually see in terms of you know, these metrics, right? We see that these weeks of supply numbers, right? We can typically ship out of stores where we bump up sort of this weeks of supply metric by between 20 and 40 percent. What does that mean? That means that the chance that you're cannibalizing an, an in store order has gone down dramatically, okay? This onesies thing, right? We can sort of increase kind of the, the sales rate of these onesies, the, the things that actually got returned by a customer by between 10 and 20 percent. This is a big deal, right? Split shipments, we could reduce this between you know, 23 and 50 percent, right? And you'll see that like shipping cost, right, in all of these implementations, roughly zero. This is actually more a factor of tuning, right? In the sense that when you actually talk to these retailers, they would much rather push the, the, the inventory out, right? Get rid of it, get, sell it, because it's not going to be worth anything, as opposed to actually saving on, uh, you know, on the shipping cost. So in some ways, without changing shipping costs, right, from the current sort of state of the art, we're actually able to get to a place where we're essentially making more sales. They're more focused on kind of top line metrics. Um, you know, in, in kind of measuring out what this has kind of done, right, I think over sort of last year, this impacted about $10 billion, this algorithm I just talked about, impacted about $10 billion worth of transactions. And uh, you know, if you attribute gross margin improvements to these, those gross margin improvements, and this is how I started out the talk, right, are somewhere between 2 and 5%. Okay? Uh, and it's also led to lots of follow-on questions and, and experiments. Right? 
So you know, one follow-on question is, hey, listen, if you can actually run one of these algorithms in the background, right? when a customer shows up on your website, you can actively think about whether it makes sense to actually offer that customer uh, you know, free shipping in uh, a day. Why? Because on the one hand, you can actually build a model that shows how conversion is likely to increase right? as a result of, uh, uh, of, of, of making that offer. On the other hand, you know the cost of making this offer thanks to this kind of dual variable thing we just talked about. Okay? Um, there's sort of a tremendous amount of kind of software stuff that goes on behind the scenes with running a system like this. I actually don't want to talk about it just, just sort of in the interest of time. And uh, you know, given, uh, given the audience, I'd rather actually talk about open problems, right? But I'm happy to talk about software-related issues uh, sort of after the fact. There's sort of a significant kind of story over there. So now let's talk about open problems, OK? Uh, problems where I think like, you know, there's work, but I think we can do a lot better, OK? So here's the first one. Right, uh, multi-item orders. Okay, so let's just think about multi-item orders for a second. Everything I talked about so far took an order, split up the order into its component pieces, did some magic, and then after the fact, right, massaged this somehow uh, so that you know you got a good answer. Even the Jacine paper that I referred to, right, that does kind of this this correlated round, uh, this correlated uh, randomization in essence, correlated rounding in essence, right. Even that paper really is, is sort of solving, in effect, independent problems and just rounding in a clever way. Right? Can we actually get to the heart of, of, of really what, what's, what's actually going on over here? So I believe the answer is actually yes. And so I want to sort of present some thoughts on how one might actually approach this. Right? So here's kind of the high level thinking. Right? So earlier, I modeled the reward as this sort of linear function in x. It's much more natural to think of this reward as being super modular in x. Okay? And so now you can start sort of saying to yourself, well, OK, so first off, what's my myopic problem? Right? F forget about the, 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 the problem that looks to the future. What's the myopic problem? Well, the myopic problem over here right, is actually a pretty hard one. Uh, it's at least as hard as sort of non-metric facility location. Right? Um, so what's the, you know, what's, the, what's the challenge? So why, why can't we just throw it to an integer programming solver? Right? So we can't throw it to an integer programming solver because what we'll need to do is we'll need to actually solve this optimization problem in well under 50 milliseconds. Okay, why? This is part of the decision loop, right? So imagine that you put this on the back end of somebody shopping, right? And they have multiple things in their cart. If you're solving a metric facility, non-metric facility location in the background, right? You're likely going to break these SLAs. So somehow or the other, what we've actually got to figure out is how do we solve this sort of problem really, really fast, right? And the hope over here, to my mind, is that this is different from a sort of generic, uh, you know, non-metric facility location problem. It's different in the sense that there's an interesting scaling in practice. Typically, you have many, many more facilities, i.e., your sort of supply nodes, right? Than you have demands, okay? And in this regime, right? Uh, in the world of sort of parametric optimization, right? Uh, this is actually a favorable regime for exact solutions, right? To uh, non-metric facility location, uh, 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 if you take sort of a parametric sort of dynamic programming approach. Okay. So one, I think, open question is to ask: Well, okay, stage one, can we solve this sort of myopic problem super fast? And then stage two, right? Can I actually interpret Solving this myopic problem, right, as sort of a column generation sort of subroutine in a much larger uh, sort of offline optimization problem, right? Net net, the idea would be to try and extend either JSON's work or the online work, right, to a setting where, as opposed to thinking about orders that split up, you're thinking about these orders that you know you've got a general sort of submodular cost, and you have some approach that solves that very fast. So to me, we we don't have great solutions to this in practice. Right? And it's begging for a good solution. OK? All right. Here's another one. Right? And I think this is like to, to, to especially if you're a theorist, right? I think this is a really, really interesting question. So uh, prior to Jason's work, right, uh, Steve Graves had this nice paper with Russ Algor and, and uh, Ping Shu at, at Amazon that basically said the following. Okay? It said that, OK, so these orders come in, right? And the way these systems are built, they make a decision on an order immediately. Now, do you really need to make an order, a decision on the order immediately? Right? Not really. Right? You only need to make the decision until kind of the next pick wave, so to speak, 
at the distribution center until kind of the next quote unquote wave at the store. Right? So you've got some time. Right? And what can you do if you have some time? Right? One thing you can actually do is you just wait, right? Collect these orders and then batch and solve. Right? You can collect these orders, batch and solve. Right? Um, now an interesting sort of question over here, right, to my mind. Oh, and, and what did they show? They show that this works. Right? Not surprisingly. It actually works pre pretty well. So I think a bigger question over here, right, and as I mentioned, this is I think something of interest if you're a theorist, right, uh, is sort of what's sort of the fundamental value of future look ahead in these online problems that I just talked about. Let me say this a different way, right? So if you think about batching, batching is no different than just sort of being able to look ahead a little bit. Sort of the same thing, right? And this sort of raises a very nice question of like, okay, what does future look ahead actually mean? Now there's actually some very nice quiet papers in fairly stylized settings that actually place tremendous value on future look ahead. So two papers uh, by Kwang Shu at Stanford, that's the Spencer 16 and the Shu 18 paper, right? Uh, actually talk about the value of future look ahead in a queuing setting where you're actually diverting kind of patients coming in and things like that, right? And they show that you know, even, if, even with a little bit of future look ahead, you get a lot of value. And then uh, Bahide Manshadi at Yale, along with uh, I think Patrick Jallier and a couple of others, have this very nice paper talking about sort of the value of batching uh, in uh, organ transplants. Okay, so that's another place where you can kind of wait to actually solve a, a, a matching problem. And the longer you wait, the kind of more efficient you are. But you don't want to wait for too long because then you kind of risk delaying, uh, you know, delaying a transplant. In their case, over here you risk well shipping something out to the customer. I think this is sort of a very exciting open problem to ask. Okay, in the set in the setting of the AdWords problem. Right, or the modification of the AdWords problem that I just showed you, what's the value of batching over there? And to my mind, that's something people don't know an answer to. I think that would be just a basic sort of thing, just a basic interest, and it clearly has practical sort of uh, uh, practical applications and value. And then the final thing I want to kind of leave you with, right, is uh, sort of multi-objective multi optimization. So I kind of slipped under the rug, right, the fact that we're kind of, we have these four or five or six, and actually some people have 10 or 12, write different things that they actually care about. It's like some alphabet soup of metrics that they, that they you know, value. And then they'll have some combination of this alphabet soup. Right? Well, how do you actually come up with sort of the right combination of this alphabet soup? Right? Because the ranges may be different. Right? Like one thing's in dollars, the other thing's in days. How, how, how do you actually think about this? Right? Uh, here's one thought. Okay? If, if you gave this problem to me in the offline setting, I'd have a natural answer. I'd say, oh, just solve some kind of Nash fair solution. Right? which is Nash fair across the different objectives. An open question over here is how does sort of this Nash fair thing work in the online problem that I just talked about? And again, why is this valuable? This, I cannot stress how much practical value there is to actually doing this. Right? One of the biggest problems with running these systems are the knobs associated with each of these KPIs that you're actually optimizing. So as opposed to kind of thinking about a human being sitting there tweaking one of these knobs, right, what's ex exceptionally valuable uh, right, is, is actually a way to kind of really get to an 80-20 solution on every dimension, and they won't complain. And uh, there's actually, I've not had time to talk about this, a nice heuristic that seems to accomplish this, but we can't pr prove anything about this. Okay? So I, I think there's, there's, there's more work that one can do here as well. So just to summarize, right, my last slide, right, here's what we talked about today. Okay? We talked about what, to my mind, is a close cousin to revenue management, okay? this fulfillment optimization problem. What we saw is that the classic fluid ideas right, that have worked in traditional revenue management work well over here, provided you have the appropriate scale. Okay? Um, and you consider we can do the various, uh, you know, various combinations, right? fulfillment, fulfillment plus pricing, fulfillment plus pricing plus assortment, and so forth. Second, we said sometimes the, sale, the scale simply isn't there. Right? Why? Because you have nodes that are carrying like one unit of inventory right? in that size, in that color, or whatever it is. Right? And so what we saw over there, is these sort of primal dual algorithms seem to work well over there. And we had some theory as well. In terms of open problems, we laid out a few open problems, right? Multi-item orders, batching, combining multiple competing objectives, and so forth. But I think the overall sort of takeaway over here for all of you, I think, is uh, this problem is, is just going to get more complicated. Why? Right? Reta the, the only dimension along which retailers are competing today is essentially speed to customer. Right? Access to product and speed to customer. Those are kind of the magic things that are happening today. Right? And as those levers get more and more important, the import of like, doing this gets more and more important. Right? So that was kind of meant to be Jason's and my kind of like key 
sort of objective. I hope uh, you know that the piece was good and you actually took something away. Uh, thank you all for your time.